that, but right, at least because you know, I'm, I keep telling you, know, we got to talk about it another time. I get to my okay. next guest. All right, Jennifer, okay. thanks for the update. Okay, thanks, Bernie. Bye. Bye. Christian Youth by Stephen. I got you. I'm here. Can you okay, hear me? go ahead and count the five for me. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, again. One, two, three, four, five. All right, here we go. Hashtag sleeping in have been retweeted over a million times by lazy Catholic teens while tweets like if God was real How come there's so much murder and I'm still Catholic? I just don't go to church or believe in Jesus have been especially successful with college students who are questioning the church's teachings It's really cool to see that the Pope is as active on social media and as skeptical about God as I am Look, he just tweeted. I'm not religious. I'm spiritual that's totally how I feel. Pope Benedict's aides say his next project involves reaching out to Muslims by sitting down with Islamic leaders and proclaiming his undying allegiance to Allah. This is the Onion News Network. And now, live from the studios of Freedom's Phoenix, <laughs> Ernest Hancock. Believe me when I say we have a difficult time ahead of us. But if we are to be prepared for it, we must first shed our fear of it. I stand here without fear because I remember. I remember that I am here not because of the path that lies before me, but because of the path that lies behind me. I remember that for 100 years we have fought these machines. And after a century of war, I remember that which matters most. We are still here! Declare your independence of me, Ernest Hancock, here in Phoenix, Arizona. A from the B-E-A-U-T full studios of Freedoms of the Nest, FreedomsPhoenix.com. Uh, uh, Stephen Kinsella. Oh, man, intellectual property. I got a bunch, a bunch, a bunch, a bunch, a bunch of updating we need to do. In the next hour, Frederick Heffernell is going to be talking to us about the Nobel Prizes for whatever. You know, this Nobel thing. I'm like, I'm not sure I want one. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, seriously. So we'll get into that. Stephen Kinsella, intellectual property. I have a lot of specific issues to do. But first, you know, how are you? I'm very good. How are you doing, Ernie? Okay, this is, let me tell you, it was probably three years ago about where we first were introduced. We had you on the show. We talked about various things. Man, this intellectual property, if that is not a touchy issue for some people, including, you know, libertarians arguing about how many libertarians can dance on the head of the freedom pen. I mean, you know, they are definitely, you know, one side or the other on this thing. And I'm, and even the intellectual property, if you got a, if that is a property, who enforces it? I mean, or a bunch of anarchist libertarian. Well, we need to have a enough government to enforce intellectual property. I mean, you know. So I'm I'm wondering how the debate has been going over the last few years. When in, on my radar screen, it really started, you know, hitting the libertarian as we're we argued all this. To, okay, war, we got that taken care of. Well, the the force of Okay, we got that, and and we can privatize this, and we're we're making our way more towards a volunteer. We're getting closer and closer and closer, and then. Intellectual property. How how's uh, your position holding up, and what is your position? Go. Okay, so um, I agree with you. I understand what you're talking about. Um, it is a touchy issue. It's hard to accept. Um, it, my impression is that more and more libertarians have become opposed to intellectual property. They they see the problems with it. They see how the government is using it as an excuse to police the internet, for example. Um, so I think more and more people are becoming hostile to it. The problem is, look, I don't think it's the worst problem in the world. It's one of the top three or four or five, I think, actually. I Go think ahead and bring your camera down a little bit for me. Bring your camera down a little bit for me, will you please? Oh, sorry. Yeah. There, there you go. How's that? Hell Beach. So Got I think, it. I, it's, it's one of the top <laughs> issues, but the what makes it, in a way, one of the worst problems is that it goes under the rubric of property, right? So people are confused by this. We don't we don't believe the drug war is a property rights issue. Or in other words, we don't believe that you can justify the drug war by calling it a property rights issue. In fact, it violates property rights. Same thing with regular war. Same thing with the central the central bank, the Federal Reserve, things like that. Okay, 
But the problem with IP is we sell these patent and copyright laws um, as property rights, and most of us are in favor of property rights. So when the government calls it a property right, we're sort of confused. Well, should we be in favor of it or should we not be in favor of it? And then you have these people that are opposed to the state, opposed to legislation as a way of making law. They get confused. They're like, well, how would we have a free society that supported these property rights that really only came about because of legislation? So I think it's, it's an issue that makes people reevaluate their fundamental presuppositions about justice, about rights, about fairness, about freedom, liberty, and property rights. Well, how do you define a pro- – see, you're, you're right. I, I would see that they would take advantage of using certain intellectual. Well, of course, I'm intellectual. I, I, I support intellectuals. I'm an intellectual supporting kind of guy. Property, absolutely. Prop, if you can, you know, define something, you know, uh, in such a way that you know, you like you say, libertarians go, well, of course, we're intellectual property supporters. I mean, you know, so I, I could see it's a naming thing. But what are we actually talking about? And we'll get to the. Um, Shire Society, Davi Barker, L. Neil Smith thing. At the Freedom Summit this um, February, we had Judge, Federal Magistrate Judge Buttrick, you know, was going to do an arbitration mediation Friday night. Kind of, we were working on that behind the scenes. We didn't announce it because we were going back and forth between everyone. And in the end, L. Neil Smith decided, look, I'm not putting up what I consider to be my property up for evaluation by somebody, which is a perfectly legitimate, you know, uh, concern and a position that a lot of us would take on things that we believe that's our property. Hey, I'm not putting it up for discussion. It's mine. Well, the problem is, and we'll get into it. Let me go ahead and define it, and we'll get in, in, uh, because I think this is illustrative of a very good point. L. Neal Smith, in some of his writings, I don't know, decades ago, wrote a thing as the Declaration of Unanimous Consent. Right. Well, that was signed it a long time ago. Right. I remember that. Now, that was taken by the uh, Keniacs or Free State guys or Shire Society or Ian and those guys. They thought that was cool. You know, it wasn't go, take, It wasn't taken. Let's step back. It wasn't taken. It was copied and used and remodeled. All right. So I mean, they, he didn't. He didn't. He's not missing his. Okay. No, his we'll get. You'll so help me out here. I'm sure. I'm. You know. Thank you. But you know, the point mm-hmm. is, is that that was copied, used, uh, took the brain cells that accumulated that information, regurgitated it into their own whatever. So Davi Barker took and stylized it, and you know, did the calligraphy on it, and the Shire Society Declaration. Well, instead of being honored, or this is exactly what I wanted to happen, or manifested in, or whatever, El Neal, you know, I, 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 I'm not really sure. Uh, the argument was, hey, it's mine. I should at least get some credit. I should, some, which they, of course, acknowledged. Which he did they, get credit. Yeah, yeah, they acknowledged that, you know, it came from him. He actually didn't want credit. He said, this is not. They, well, they because they changed work. it right. a little bit and modified. Let me finish, Stephen. They modified right. it to the point to where he's going, look, you vandalized my stuff. Man, you changed it. It's not my now. It's not mine anymore. Right? It's you know. It's art. You don't want me to know about something. You don't want me to you know take that property or whatever's in my head. Then don't give it to me. I mean, you know, then you know because the second it hits my head, it's mine now. You know, or also or shared or it's words or whatever. So this argument, it sounds like you know something about it. Go ahead and define the argument. We got like a minute and a half here of what the argument is, and then we'll use this as a really good example of what we're talking about. It goes into other areas, but. Can El Neal claim, in your opinion, a, a a property right in words that he writ, wrote on paper? No, he cannot. Uh, he doesn't actually I, – I, look, I respect him. I like his works. I've, I've bought a lot of them. I signed his declaration. But in my opinion, I agree with the anarchist Benjamin Tucker who wrote over 100 years ago. He said, if you want your invention to yourself, keep it to yourself. Okay. If you make an idea or information public, then you have to expect that other people might learn from it. If you sell a product, then you have to expect that people might compete with you by copying or emulating what you do. If I sell an iPhone and it's a hit product, a new touchscreen smartphone, I have to expect that if it's a popular hit and makes profits, that profit signal will draw competitors. This is what we call in quote marks on the free market competition. This is what we call learning. This is what we call emulation. There is nothing immoral or wrong with copying, emulating people, or learning from what information we acquire in, on the free market. If you are going to make a fact public for whatever your reasons, 
then you have to expect that people might learn from that information. And if that involves the ability to copy what you're doing or to learn from it or build on it or remix it, then so be it. That is what we call freedom and the free market. The attempt to stop this is actually anti-private property, anti-liberty, and empowers the state to restrict our freedoms, especially with the internet, which is one of the most important tools for freedom in existence in human history. And anything we do should be aimed at keeping the internet free to preserve our liberties and preserve our freedoms. Okay, L. Neil Smith would disagree. And we're going to talk about whatever that disagreement is when we come back. You know, can you have such a thing as intellectual property? They named it that. They got a category for it. They got, you know, it's used in uh, the vernacular. I mean, we got, you know, uh, copyright and, you know, and uh, trademark and all this other. You know, we're going to talk about it. Stephen Kinsella on this very issue when we come back on Declare Your Independence with me, Ernest Hancock. A science fiction comic adventure from Big Head Press. Quantum Vibe. It's year 2523. There are colonies on Venus, Mars, and Mercury. People travel in bubbles, fly at hyperspeed. With brain implants and artificial gravity. A scientific genius sends his clever assistant to say, I'm an adventure through the solar system on a secret mission. And corporate villains crave the opportunity To steal a profit from others' ingenuity A scientific genius and his clever assistant Set out on an adventure through the solar system On a secret mission to find the key To access new frontiers and save liberty Hello, back. Yeah. Um, you know, one thing, Stephen, I'm really... I, I want to make sure L. Neil Smith's argument is uh, presented and pure. If I could really understand what it is, okay. And let, let me back up a second. Let me back. I didn't know we were going to talk about Smith, and that's fine. This is about two. You, you, this is about two or three years ago, so it's not a fresh debate that I'm aware of. No, yeah, it is. It's really been amping up. You know, I've been, okay. you know, okay. asked to be part of hey. uh, mediation and doing all that. We were going to do it at the summit, and Judge Buttrick is going to judge it. And oh, it's got, you hey. know, it's, I wasn't aware of that. Maybe, maybe you can explain that. But um, I'll, I'll be happy to present his argument. But to be honest and fair to him, he doesn't have an argument. All he says is it's stealing. His argument well, is that you're stealing the work. Well, see, it's a good foundation because we're on LRN. You know, it's Ian Freeman's network. There is this controversy amping up again to the point okay. where okay. L. Neal was calling Pasha over at Silver Circle Movie, um, okay. you know, that he has a relationship with, complaining about Davi. So this kind of got resurrected, okay. and I talked was, to L. Neal. I wasn't aware. Okay, I wasn't aware. I didn't even know that it was online. Well, um, do you know who John Buttrick is? No, I don't. He's a federal. He was a libertarian for governor here in the '90s uh, and legislature, and went on to become a superior court judge. And now is a federal magistrate, and he's a good oh. friend of ours. And he speaks at the Freedom Summit on a regular basis. And uh, his whole thing is, you know, in the future when we have a voluntary society, you're still going to have conflict resolution. How are you going to do that? So, okay. so okay. this was a perfect example. I'm going to go into that. Yeah, I, is, I've actually written uh, international law books on arbitration, and I, I know a little bit about it. So, uh, but I'm a libertarian, not a federal magistrate. Yeah, Unlike, no, I understand. The point that I'm bringing this up is one it is kind of fresh, but it looks like we're not going to get it fixed at the the summit because uh, El Neil's like going, "Look, I'm not putting my, you know, I believe it's mine. Why am I putting it up for any kind of dispute? I I decided, you know." Problem over. Uh, okay. So I, go, right. I mean, I, I don't know what level of abstraction you want me to go into. I'd be happy to talk about that on any level you like. No, um, I, I, I already. I it's, Stephen, my show. I get to do what I want. Here we go. Okay, get yeah. ready go now. So the thing is, is that it, at the core of everything that you're going to say, this is a legitimate and current and uh, uh, talked about topic right now because you're saying El Neil does not have. An intellectual property right. You know, okay, that's fine. We don't have to talk about, you know, drag out just this one particular thing, but you can't just say that. You got to say why he doesn't. No, no, or, I'll be happy to. And I need no, you I, to I articulate L. Neal's best argument of why. Now, that doesn't mean it's legitimate in your mind or it doesn't, what I don't care. Mm -hmm. But I need you to, you know, because he's not here to defend himself, to at least repeat what you think he's understanding. Then we'll chop yeah, it up. No, but I need no, him fine. to be I represented. Can I can do that. That's All right, no problem. Here we go. I got it. 
call 1-800-441-6064. That's 1-800-441-6064. What's up next? Visit the Liberty Radio Network program guide to find out at shows.lrn.fm. That's shows.lrn.fm. To be a part of the show, call 602-264-2800. 602-264-2800. And now, Ernest Hancock. Welcome back to Declare Your Independence with me, Ernest Hancock, here in Phoenix, Arizona. Stephen Kinsella. I mean, talking, there's all kinds of news and everything, intellectual property, but we got to talk about what we know. What does it mean? You know, so here we have, I want to get, I don't want to dwell on it any more than we really need to, but the thing is, is that here we have a good, hardcore, long time considered to be on the edge, fringe, kind of no compromise libertarian that believes he's got a property right and stuff he wrote, you know, decades ago. It's mine, 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 mine. So, Stephen, I just need, from your perspective, I, I know you disagree with them, and I'm, you know, I'm, I, I lean more towards voluntarist kind of whatever. You don't want me to know about it. Don't put it in my head. But the thing is, is I go the best. You know, just have fairness to El Neal. I need what is it that he is saying that would resonate with any of us, or is there anything? He, he, articulate his position. He has property right or some kind of ownership of these words that he put up in the way and nobody else can use any of the I mean argue his case for him a little bit try and help me understand his perspective oh absolutely so he's got two cases uh the first one would be legal like he could argue he does have a legally recognized property right in his novels let's say or in his writings under the copyright statute so it is true that there is a copyright law in the US and in most of the world uh, that recognizes a property right in these artistic creations and original works of authorship. Okay, so he does have a legal right, but that I don't think he would want to rely upon that because he's an anarchist like I am, and not every law the state enacts and enforces is compatible with justice, uh, like laws against slavery, laws for eminent domain, tax laws, drug laws, etc. So just because there's a law doesn't mean it's legitimate. So he does have a legal right. The question is, should he have a legal right? Should there be property rights in patterns of information and in writings? And the the argument he's relying on, as best I can tell from what he's said, and I've read some of his um, writings on on Facebook and on the on the Free Keen, if I recall, forums, etc., is the standard argument that you own what you create. Which is a Lockean type of argument, the labor argument, the idea that you own yourself, you own your body, therefore you own what you your labor, and therefore you own what you mix that labor with and what you create in the world. It's sort of a Randian argument, the idea that if you create something, some nebulous thing that has economic value, that you have a property right in it. And a poem or a novel or a paper. It's a thing of value in the modern economy, and therefore you have a property right in it. That's the basic argument. It's full of fallacies, and it's full of confusions, but I think that's the argument. And that type of argument is used by libertarians to justify regular property rights, property rights in land and in the products of your labor, like when you sell your labor services and you want to get paid for that. You don't want the government to take a cut of that. So you, you, you might fall back on the argument, I own my labor, I own myself, I own my, the, the, the fruits of my labor, so you shouldn't tax that. So you can see a sort of a common ground in these types of arguments, but it's really uh, based upon some economic and political confusions. Okay, now that's a very good, you know, I, I, thank you for that. And you look at things like, uh, we got to go to China to be free. I mean, you know, they don't, they, you know, it's copyright, I don't know what the hell you're talking about. You know, we're not taking anything from you. I made a whole bunch of CDs here, and we're putting them on the street corner and selling, you know, get over it. Oh, no, you got to have crap. Well, who's making that complaint? Who's the pressure doing that? What's the philosophy that they're doing? So this, you can see from my standpoint, this is the argument. This is a perfect example. This is it. So you have, so, so you're saying there isn't a role of government or anybody to have some kind of, there's a differentiation between 
you know, what is created that is tangible that somebody can have and it's one of and they transfer around and so on, but an idea that can be represented in what? Ones and zeros? I mean, it can be replicated a bunch of times. It can be a muse, uh, a song. It can be music. It can be a book. It can be a movie. It can be, you know, at what point, because I deal with it on Freeman's Phoenix all the time. We get away with a lot of stuff because, you know, it's news or or uh, free speech or whatever the heck, and they and, and, and the big thing going on with... Fair use, yeah. You're relying on the fair use exception, probably. Well, I'm not relying on I don't give a crap. I don't even look. I mean, I'm just like, you know, I, I, I got attorneys. Go, go deal with them. I'm going to do whatever that uh, forwards information. And if you want to come after me, well, heck, that's, that's new news that we need to talk about. You know, so, I'm, so I don't really rely on anything other than my sense of, you know, information and sharing and have. But, you know, you'll have some libertarian, this intellectual property right thing. Now, what makes the difference in your mind that you don't apply property rights to things that you create with your mind that go out there? We haven't got to that part yet. Yet. That's what I wanted to build up to. So go ahead and go. How would you okay. distinguish the difference to where those kind of rules don't apply? Uh, basically, you have to step back and think, why do we even need property rights? Why, do, why does this institution arise? It arises because we live in a world where you and I want to use things to get things done, right? Our bodies and other things. You want to drink milk. You want to have a piece of land. You want to have a house. You want to have weapons. You want to have fishing equipment, whatever. These things, by their nature, are what's called scarce or rivalrous resources. There are things that can only be used by one person at a time. So either you have a system of rules that say who can use these things, or you don't. If you don't, then we f we're, we're having like a battle of everyone against everyone, a war of all against all. Most of us prefer peace. We prefer society. We prefer cooperation. And we have a dim recognition that if we have a system of rules that say – Listen, let's have an orderly way of assigning rights to use these things because only one person can use these resources at a time. So we come up with these property rights because it helps make for a prosperous, orderly, civilized, cooperative society. Um, and we pretty much all agree on the common sense rules. Whoever gets the thing first gets to use it, or if you sell it to someone else, then they're the, they're the new owner. It's pretty common sense, but the fundamental issue is when we identify such a scarce resource, the kind of thing that there can be a conflict over, then we have to have a property rule that says who gets to own it. And that's why we have disputes. That's why we have conflict. It's always over a given resource. And the libertarian answer and the common sense answer has always <laughs> been the first user or the person that buys it or gets it by contract or inheritance from a previous owner is the rightful owner. The problem with making ideas – uh, a a property right, giving a property right and ideas is that you you really cannot control an idea, you can't control information. Really, it's a disguised way of getting control over people's property rights. So, for example, if you have a copyright in a novel, that means that you can use the government courts or the legal system to tell someone that they can't use their own property in a certain way, right? Or if you have a patent on an invention. You can tell them you can't use your own property in a certain way. So the fundamental mistake behind this notion is the idea that creation is a source of property rights. It's really not. Creation is a source of wealth. What creation means, what production means is you own resources already, like I own some raw materials. And I use my labor, my creativity to fashion them into something more valuable. So I'd make it more valuable, but I have to own it already. Creation is not an independent source of ownership. All right. We're starting to get into the nitty-gritty, and I got a great example, another one, when we come back. Unintended Consequences, the book. Oh, you can get it in the Moby file. You can get it on Kindle. You can get PDF and everything on Freedom's Phoenix in today's show. Oh, I'm breaking some law. I just know it. Did you know that Free Aid is a mutual aid, educational, and networking organization? <clears throat> okay, good example is you're familiar with the book Unintended Consequences or whatever, John Ross's thing. Does that ring a bell? Say again? Unintended Consequences. You ever heard of that book? 
Um, it was it was written in '94. It was really big on in the gun community. It was uh, you know it, it just BATF would yeah. go to the gun yeah, retailers yeah, yeah. at the shows and you know you sure you want to carry. It was a big controversy. Well, it's going to be yeah. reprinted again. Copies are going. If you look it up, you can get you know from 190 to 400 dollars a hardback copy. I mean, it is a very popular book. What happened is we were talking about it, and somebody sent me. Uh, all these different files from the internet. You had the Kindle file, the Amazon file, the this file, the PDF file, that. We put it up on Freedoms Phoenix and just said, you know, here, you, everybody's screaming about it. you can't get it and nobody has it and you got it and whatever. And we put it up. So they just download it and read it and done. And it's one of the most popular downloads on my entire site is downloading that book. So okay. what okay. laws am I breaking? Probably a bunch. Don't care. You know, I mean, you know, but see, that's how I'm like, yeah, you know, come, come get me. I mean, I don't give a crap. But the thing is, is that, you know, this is, I am under threat from whom, for what, and who would, you know, prosecute that, yes. you know, I mean, how, and then under what guys I went, you know, it almost, you want them to do it just to give, you know, some, uh, notoriety to Freedom's Phoenix and the book. I mean, you know, I, I don't care. John Ross, when he he and I go back, way back, we did a thing called SAFE. We still have it. Second Amendment is for everyone. And mm -hmm. safe, safegunowners.org and com and all that crap. So what happened was he wanted to have a blurb on it. Well, I was a young activist. I didn't know what the hell he wanted. He goes, how come you didn't write it? I go, oh, you want me to support it that way? Hell, I thought you we bought three cases of the book. I didn't know what the hell you wanted, you know? <laughs> Don't say I didn't support you. I bought three cases of the book, you know. So, so it's um, I just didn't understand. But the thing is, is that these guys they really have an ownership, and it's mine, mine, freaking mine. I'm, I, you know, Ayn Rand. All that other stuff went out the window when it came down to it was mine. Okay, so the intellectual property, I would see that they would look at this as a. A compliment as real libertarians are like, yes, my whole point was to get these ideas out. My whole point, oh, I made some money. Okay, that's cool. Well, go where yogurt says the real money is merchandising. I mean, you know, it's kind of so I, I, I'm really trying to, that is the line. All this other stuff we talk about, blah, 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 is it can you copyright or should the government be there to protect? ideas and what is and what i want to talk about now and we, i'll bring up the unintended consequences thing real quick but when we uh get back into you what i really want to get is how much this line of thought stifles innovation you know in 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 patents and in uh mm -hmm. innovations and in energy and so like they go to um, elon musk and they go yeah you're building all this great you know rocket engine new technology and everything how come but you're not even using the patent he goes why i'm the customer you know, I mean, who else is going to be buying my crap? You know, I'm the guy doing it, and why the hell would I give, you know, uh, details to my competitors, and my competitors are governments, and I'm asking for permission to protect my ideas. Screw that. I mean, that's just a practical example of the intellectual property does not work at the highest level. You know, so I'm going, all right, SpaceX makes all their own stuff. They, you know, yeah, who else is going to buy it? You want to copy it? Knock yourself out. If you can, you, you want to buy one of my engines, go right ahead. <laughs> it costs this much. So this is why I want to get, you know, into the stifling of innovation and so on because of intellectual property rights. So that's what I'm building up to. Yeah, got it. No All problem. Right, here we go. If you enjoy LRN.FM, please contribute to your favorite shows via their websites and become an amplifier at amp.lrn.fm. That's amp.lrn.fm. There are those that just want to be left alone and those that just won't leave them alone. Which one are you? The Ernest Hancock Show. Baby, oh, we got Stephen Kinsella on the line. Oh, this is you know. I, I tell you, let me tell you the story. What's going on? We have on Freedoms Phoenix. We were talking about it, and one of our listeners out of Houston, I think it was, had a bunch of files. You know, you can read it on Kindle. You can do it on your Amazon Nook, whatever thing. You have PDF. You can do it on the computer or on your uh, Easy Reader on your tablet or whatever. Unintended consequences. Now, a lot of you guys may not remember. It's like 20 years ago when it was came out right after Waco and all this kind of stuff. It was all how the gun 
uh, issue was used by the man for control and so on. It was a fascinating novel, very popular. BATF is going to gun shows and any retailer that has it, and they're going, are you sure you want to be selling this kind of man? Big controversy. Tried to go after him. It's a long story. But I think it's an excellent idea. It's going to be reprinted. They're going back into print with it, and that was another fight. And I'm going, you know, we have the opportunity to put this up for everybody. I know it's very popular because you go online, you want to buy, that book is minimum like $200 for a hardbound book. It goes three, dollars $400. Nice, crisp, good hardbound copies, 300 bucks. This $300 version a friend of mine got for another friend, a young man that wanted he never could, got, he bought it for $300. Here. He had some money, gave it to him, you know, because he thought it's a cool thing to do. And I'm going, wow. So me putting that up, you know, uh, I'm sure I violated something, or somebody can say I did. I think they should come after me. <laughs> Let's talk about it. Because this is a good example, uh, but it's more than that. Patents on energy devices, and Mr. Tesla does this, and Einstein did that, and so-and-so came and changed and put another screw in and did and kind of different drawing perspective of the orientation of the CAD file of the whatever, and we're going to repatent everything, and nothing gets done. Elon Musk is building brand new kind of man. I, we haven't had new rocket technology for 40 50 years he goes i can do this myself gets his tony stark 3d viewing kind of making 3d printing of titanium with lasers 3d printing rocket nozzles and this is where we're going and he goes we can go straight to manufacturing from my head into the cad into a 3d printed onto the rocket done and am i going to patent that why would i because they went on a ted talk they're on how come you're not patenting this you don't patent why are you patenting and he goes why would i patent he goes, well, I, I'm, I'm going to go up there and use the very people that, uh, who's my competition, the government? I'm buying my own stuff. Why don't I need to patent something I can just make and I buy? If I put it out there and I get all the detailed drawings, they'll just rip it off, you know, whatever competitive advantage I have. And that's assuming they would even give me the patent. Why am I asking them? Screw them. I'm done with this patent thing. I'm like, right on. So let's talk to Stephen about that. The innovation that is canceled out, the, the, the problems that we have because of this idea of intellectual property, how much is humanity suppressed because of it, Stephen? Well, it's hard to figure out the numbers. Uh, I've done estimates myself. Most people are trying to find uh, justifications for IP, patent law, copyright law, and so they, they do these empirical studies. Um, and they all come out inconclusive or they conclude that there's something wrong here. Um, my best estimate is that like in the United States alone, under the patent system alone, forget copyrights, we're probably imposing one, two, three, four hundred, five hundred billion dollars a year of net loss on the economy, maybe more uh, because of this. Copyright is less of an economic thing, more of a freedom thing, right? So in a way, I think copyright's the worst damage. Patents, the patent system, I look at it as a $500 billion a year tax. Taxes are bad, but they just slow growth down, okay? The copyright system is used to justify extraditing people from other countries, uh, invading uh, you know, Kim.com's home in New Zealand, uh, ratcheting up cyber law protection and uh, the control over the internet, which is a fundamental tool for freedom. So the damage done by copyright is almost immeasurable because it's, it's, a, it's a restriction on our freedoms. What we need to understand is that copyright and patent law originated – copyright originated with the literal uh, control of thought and the press by the government which culminated in the Statute of Anne of 1709. This was an attempt to form a guild system where the government and the church could stop the printing of books uh, that they didn't want printed. Right? It, it was an attempt to censor ideas, and that's what it's being used for now. Authors still, because of the copyright system, basically sell their souls to the publishing industry. I mean, just look up Type in Harlequin, you know these Harlequin romances? Mm -hmm. these, there's, a, there's a class action lawsuit going on right now because these Harlequin romance authors can't put on Amazon ebooks of their back catalog, which could make them tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars because of copyrights they entered into with the publishing industry, which took the, you know, stepped into the place of the state and the guild system in the aftermath of the statute of Anne. Patents 
originated in the attempt to monopolize and mercantilize industry. That is, the government would grant monopolies to stop competition. They would say, you're the only guy that can sell sheepskin or playing cards in a given region, and we will sell this right to you if you will give us allegiance or taxes or co help collect taxes or whatever. So it was – and in fact, the first – you know, the modern copyright – statute originated in the statute of monopolies 1623 in England and that's what it has resulted in you have Samsung and Apple and Google all battling each other on the smartphone wars for example using their patents and what they do is they stop competition from the small players because they can't afford to spend 2 3 4 5 20 million dollars on lawyers and to acquire patents so the patent system help stop competition today just like it was originally planned to do the thing is when these when these rights originated they were not confused with natural rights or property rights everyone knew they were exceptions they were government granted intrusions on freedom and the free market and that's Maybe how they, they thought, thought of it. For them. and that's how they thought of it yes but so then when when economists free market advocates started opposing these Intrusions, these privileges, these monopoly grants of the of the government, these censorship, these censorship uh, uh, mechanisms, they started calling them intellectual property rights as a way to propagandize the populace and the legislators and say, oh, it's just a type of property right because you can sell it. Obviously, hell, you can sell you can sell political favors. Does that mean it's a property right? You know, does it mean that lobbying the government should be a property right? It's ridiculous. Uh, people think of their social security grants as property rights. That doesn't mean that we are in favor of social security. So we have to not let the government label d confuse us, which it has done a lot of libertarians uh, like Smith. You know, my thing is, is that, uh, you know, I, the best way for me is if you don't want me to have it as part of my mind and part of how I act and part of what I do and part of what I create and part of what I say, well, then don't tell me. I mean, you know, once it becomes, I'm not going to build firewalls in my mind. That's what starts all this cognitive dissonance. That's where you start getting into confusion. That's where you start, you know, you're, you're sitting there thinking about how you're able to think and what you're willing or able to think about and include and all that. And humanity does not march on that way. So I'm going, no, that, that's no. why I'm, I'm so supportive of just, you know, it's my mind, wherever it goes, it accumulated, whatever I got from whatever, and I'm going to do whatever I want with it without these hurdles and roadblocks that I put in my head. So what do you advocate? We're coming up on the, the break here, but I want you to think about this during the break. In, in, in comment, hopefully we can get Stephen to talk about the power of his position. If he has his position uh, is, is accepted by Generation Next as we go on, they start to, because it's only now that this is even being able to be out there to be discussed and incorporated in how we live and how we think about stuff, how much will things change? How, how far can humanity go? How quickly will we evolve? And we have we has this been a lid on our evolution? Has it been a restraint? Is it a chain on our brain? Ooh, that's a good one. I'm gonna do that. Ah, copyright! Ernest Hancock, chain on our brain. You know, it's all mine, 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 you're not allowed. Don't think about chain on brain. Chain on brain, you can't say it. Don't think about it. Don't use chain on brain. It's all mine. Mine, 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 mine. When it comes to investing in precious metals, you know. Mine, 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 mine. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah, that's one thing that's funny. You have Stephen Colbert come up with something like that. He goes, that copyright, Fox, it's mine, 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 mine. And there is a mechanism, you know, for that very thing, is there not? Can I sit there and say, go trademark, copyright, I say, so that's mine. You know what I mean? That, what, what's the mechanism for something like that? Um. For like a slogan, you mean? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's kind of... Yeah, that's, I that's trademark. That's more trademark. Yeah. But can you just claim it? I mean, do I got to go file a piece of paper? I remember um, it was uh, Los Angeles Lakers, and uh, the coach, I can't remember his name, he he trademarked the phrase three-peat. I don't know if you remember that. You know, he'd go, three-peat. You know, they're going for the third uh, NBA championship or something. Yeah, that's, three that's a trademark. So he actually did... Yeah, if you, and, and well, I'm, I'm LSU. Be careful fan, where you're going. I'm starting were, to lose you a little bit. 
Can you hear me now? Is I okay? can hear you, but uh, the video is not really going. I think it'll, it'll strip in a second. Um, yeah, no, that's a trademark issue. That's another type of IP, which we haven't talked about too much. But yeah, that's definitely a trademark. And you establish that by use. Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead and bring the camera down a little bit. I got the top okay. of your head. There you go. Yeah, you establish trademark by use. Okay, but you can file a federal mark by registration. So it's like co copyright. It's like patent to a, to a, to a degree. Um, look, I'm, I'm totally opposed to trademark as well, and I can go into that too, but that's getting into the weeds. Um, well, no, I mean, yeah, I don't want to spend a lot of time on that now. Yeah. But I, my thing is, is that, you know, innovate, humanity marches on unless there's somebody got chains around your brain. And I'm going, all right, where are the chains? That's why I'm supportive of what, you know, you're having to say and do in your work and such, because I could see for the first time in certainly my activist lifetime and so on, there was someone, you know, as passionately arguing for the elimination of intellectual property as people are arguing for property and, and and intellectually being able to back it up. And I'm going, you know, I'm glad that this is being done because I can see the stifling of it. I mean, in, in every aspect, I mean, you know, what I'm doing, I do uh, newspaper and magazine and online and the radio. And I got, I got, you know, IP, you know, deluge me from every angle. So I'm just going, look, I need to have some philosophical Hello? basis. Yeah. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah. Keep. Uh, Sorry, uh, I, I can hear you. you. were fading for a second. Go ahead. Well, yeah, when you moved, it changed a bunch of stuff here. It's catching up on the video. All right. So my I think thing is okay. I'm sorry. My signal's strong. I'm not sure. Are you sure yours is okay? At your end. When you started walking around, the signal got dropped a little bit, and the video would it was not enough bandwidth wherever it was. So anyway, it's catching I up. I think now. it's okay now. Sorry. Okay, okay, so the the thing is, is that I'm looking into the future. We're all about generation next, and as yes. we train and we uh, discuss these issues, instead of it being you know the week of copyright in junior high, and they talk about how and what and you can and can't and plagiarize and don't copy in the internet and you use too much of a paragraph kind of crap. You know, I'm going. You know, there has to be a fundamental foundational understanding of what IP is, what the role of government is, what it shouldn't be, what we need to do to free our minds, you know, for generate for this 10 to 12 year olds that are out there just now starting to be indoctrinated with this stuff. What is the replacement indoctrination? What is the replacement information? Then in the last segment here, that's what I want to get to. Okay. Absolutely. All right, here we go. .com. That's freekeen.com. You can watch the LRN Studio Cam and chat with other listeners anytime at cam.lrn.fm. That's cam.lrn.fm. And now, live from the studios of Freedoms Phoenix, Ernest Hancock. Welcome back to Declare Your Independence with me, Ernest Hancock, here in Phoenix, Arizona. Hello, Stephen Kinsella, intellectual property. This is a much more important issue than I think people realize. This is, because what are we always about? Generation Next. And what do we got with Generation Next? We need to, you know, get their, their mind uh, freed. We need them to understand all the ramifications of their decisions and how they interact with each other under what philosophy and you know of course they're going to be you know property 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 i'm a freedom guy i'm for property and then they got intellectual property is that a property why isn't it not now let's talk to the 10 12 year old child that's going into junior high and they're going to give them a dose of government because in junior high when they're starting to go through puberty when they're just starting to question and challenge the man what are they doing you got to have the most hours in school required sitting in the chair getting their indoctrination in seventh and eighth grade you have them doing government and you have them doing social studies and you have them doing i'm just a bill and you have them in that guarantee freaking tea trademark copyright intellectual property all that starts going and this is how it is According to the mandatory youth camp indoctrination leader, okay? And you're going, yeah, that's not. So what do you tell this person going into puberty and they're looking to challenge the man and I getting what? 
Their mind is free how? What is the base philosophy that you want these kids going in that are asking these very questions of what they can do? They're starting to be creative in art. They're starting to be creative in writing. They're starting to be creative in YouTubes. All of a sudden, they get a takedown notice from YouTube and say, I'm sorry. You know, that's why we're not on YouTube. We put on Vimeo and we do others and we have it on our own servers, the video, because I use Classic Rock as a rejoiner. YouTube could say, hey, you can't. I go, okay, then I don't use YouTube anymore. Bite me. You know, I'm just, I'm, I'm not playing. Where else can I go? We set up our own servers. It gets down to the point. We'll just use our own servers to archive. So I'm just going, which we do on the audio. So I'm just like, you know, this is exactly what I want to talk about. Generation next, Stephen, what should they know? Well, I think first they should, this is a good lesson. Do not trust the Constitution and all these official documents. If someone says, well, it's in the Constitution, as a justification for something, don't trust it. I mean, so what So what if it's in the Constitution? We, as libertarians and freedom advocates, have to stop worshiping America, the American founding, the founders, the Constitution, even the Declaration. These documents are not perfect. They support slavery. They support taxes. They support a central bank. They support war. There's a lot of flaws in them. They're centralizing documents. So just because patent and copyright or established by Thomas Jefferson, Madison, and his cronies at the time of the founding doesn't mean that they're justified. So stop putting your trust in you know, these, these uh, white male racist slave owners uh, at our founding, hypocritical politicians who profited greatly from the centralizing power accumul accumulation, which was the American Revolution, the American War for Independence, and the Constitution. So I would have a healthy distrust of all this crap if I was a uh, – uh, a young, independent-minded person who is a modern, anti-racist, cosmopolitan person in favor of individuals and free will. So that's the first thing. The second thing is freedom is a double-edged sword, right? So I would say if you want to get your works out there, if you want to get people to know who you are, if you want to spread your message, if you want people to read your books, if you want people to use your artwork, if you want people to – buy your product which has an inventive idea in it then the the you know the, the risk you take is that people might learn from it they might compete with you so there's a double edged sword i would say throw yourself out there be willing to be publicized try to make a name for yourself try to do something that matters but don't be afraid of the fact that you might be competed with don't be afraid of being emulated don't be afraid of being copied or having an influence on people. That's what you want to happen. You don't want to be a ripple in the pond that, dis that disappears. You want to be a, a, a change in the, you know, a force for change in our society. That's at, a good thing. Well, let me, let me go ahead thing. and get, at a fundamental level, I got a, a you know, a 12 year old, and they'll sit there and they'll go, Yep, and, and, and the intellectual armor that I use for me adding on to the patent of General Electric did the whatever thing, you know, I'm going to go ahead and take – I give you a good exa example. There's a thing – they call it the uh, Fibonacci um, sequence or something. It's how, you know, branches on trees grow. And this one 12, 13-year-old kid goes, you know, instead of moving solar panels all the time, why don't you just make them smaller and put them on like leaves following the sequence because mm -hmm. trees have figured it out that they get mm -hmm. the most sun if they blah, 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 blah. So he's like, and then I don't have to move it all the time and I get, mm -hmm. you know, a higher percentage of the yada, yada. So he goes, oh, and then somebody's like, oh, hey, man, you can't do that. I got to do And I'm going, wow, at least the kid just did it. And then you start going into all these other problems. So I'm looking at these young, very creative, innovative people that if they can get them into the first thing that goes in their mind is not how I can do it better. It's to whom I got to submit my application for permission to think about yes. it. And I go, that yeah. is the damage. So I want it, it, like you're saying, it doesn't matter what these pieces are. It doesn't. Don't be bound by this you know, chain on your brain from the beginning. You know, innovate, yeah. go, take it. It's your yet permission from Stephen Kinsella, he says. But what are the ramifications well, on the other side? Yeah, well, the system exists, okay? So they have to take into account the impact of these laws. It's unfortunate, and which is one reason libertarians should not be in support of these things. But the example you gave is a great example. Um, this kid who comes up with a new way to aim little photovoltaic receptors, he learned it from Fibonacci, right? The Fibonacci sequence. So this is an example of how all learning is incremental, but he should just be caring about getting a result done. 
He doesn't need a monopoly from government to protect him from competition. He's going to move on and do something else after this. Right? He's going to make a profit. He'll be the first mover. He'll have a reputation. He'll have fame. You know, he's going to build his skills. He'll develop networks. He'll make money. And then but he what can move on the, to the next thing. Well, what about the Cat argument? Laws let you rest on your laurels. Why <clears throat> would someone want to do that? No, I, I, I agree. And some people, they, you know, their claim to fame is a book they wrote 30 years ago. I mean, you know, I'm going, seriously, this is all you got? You know, so I'm... I and, and I don't protect it. I don't want anybody. To, so I'm I'm going and and I'm not talking about El Neo and there's some other people come to mind. But the um what happens is um I'm wondering what is stifled in the future. How much humanity is damaged by this? And I, I'm I'm and your advocacy for what you're doing. I'm hoping that it has an impact and an encouragement to people. But you have the other side. That is always going to, yeah, but we got the guns. And if you breed them out, if you train them out, if you you know, be part of a culture that no longer accepts this, that's the only way you're going to be able to combat it. So well, I'm, let, me, let me put it this way. The, the Internet views censorship as damage and routes around, around it. Yeah. Okay. And similarly, I believe that the free market views controls of information and controls of competition, which is what copyright and patent law do, as damage and routes around it. And how are we seeing this? Well, with information, with copyright, with censorship, we are seeing the rise of torrenting and encryption systems, right? So basically people are circumventing the damage of copyright law. Now, how are we seeing this in the patent world? With 3D printing, for example. 3D printing is emerging and rising, and these cornucopia machines, these Christmas machines, whatever you want to call them, could be emerging in full force in you know, 10, 20, 30 years and radically transform human society. Oh, hell, next year. I, you know, this is yeah. right now. I mean, that's all what Def Cad and White, well, Cody Wilson's one of the speakers at our yes. summit this February. And yes. the reason is, and we have uh, Charles Pax from, you know, MakerBot fame, you know, is going to be there demonstrating some stuff. And, uh, and the whole point that he was making, he's going, look, it's over. You can print. The gun was just an example. I mean, it's anything. Yes. It's a little widget knob I got in Louver on my dashboard of my car broke kind of $70 kind of I printed it for seven cents. I mean, you know, this is and, and they're going to freak. I mean, there's and, no and, way and, manufacturing. And they are using 3D printing and things like this are going to be used to and also the Silk Road and Amazon and international commerce. They are used to circumvent and That's to ev ago. basically evade patent law, just like people evade income taxes by quicksilver capital and by other techniques. Um, I think this is a good thing. This shows the market can help us outrun the nefarious, uh, you know, effects of state interventionism and attempts to control what we're doing. And this shows that the advocates of patent and copyright. Among the parents are on the wrong side of things, and they need to get with the side of the future, the side of progress. Okay, now what we're going to go ahead and do is do some bonus. I got eight minutes before the uh, you know at the top of the hour we get to Nobel Peace Prizes and stuff. But I want to go ahead and have a little bit more conversation without you know thread of break <laughs> with Stephen Kinsell. We'll just go a couple more minutes here. We're going to let the video go. We're going to let the audio go because there's some other stuff I want. To, I really see this. You know, I, Stephen, I think about. What you've done, uh, you know, for the movement and a lot of your advocacies and so on, a lot more than you think, because it comes up a lot, and I can see the stifling of innovation. You know, it, it's like uh, that, that that phrase. You know, I'm uh, I'm looking to turn myself in. And I just don't know to whom or for what. You know, but that's the mindset that they're putting Generation Next in. We're trying to free them. Defending Archimedes. We'll be right back. The Shire Free Church. Okay, now what I want to do is we'll go ahead and just let the, the video go and so on. I want to give you an opportunity, not in the thread of, you know, whatever, we can go another few minutes. Is that this is, there's a project we got, Defending Archimedes, long story, you can look it up, Defending Archimedes, Ernest Hancock, and you'll see a presentation. I did a, a PowerPoint at uh, Libertopia. But the point is this. I can see that there is a concentrated effort by they, them, those to go after Chronicle, get it all, kind of do my luminosity, uh, brain training, con academy, tracking, do and find out where all the smart guys are, and we're going to put you in service of, and you're either in service of the state or you're not in service of anybody else kind of thing. And I can see that the intelligence that is out there, it just and because I say these kinds of things, it just, you know, 
just swarms to me a lot of these young people that are of this mind and they are you know we're not even waiting on you know the bit tour kind of that's why we're so supportive of spaceship one and all our space stuff because we knew what it meant it meant private uh industry just put our own freaking satellite mm-hmm. up and bite me and we bypassed our own the more they you know mm-hmm. control the or tighter their fist the more star systems between the fingers kind of thing so i can see where this is going what role are you playing in or have you gotten feedback from the young? I mean the young. I'm talking like they're just getting teenagers. They're the young, you know, before you had to fix them. I'm tired of trying to fix everybody like we did with the Levolution. You're fixing them at 17 or something. What if you get them at 10 and you don't need to fix them? So we're working on that. What is it that you laser beam what you're having to say to them? Go ahead, go. Now? Are we yeah. online now? Yeah. No, I, I did this. I'm telling you, Stephen, I think about what you're doing way more than you think. You know, this comes up a lot. You know, I'm going. Well, I, I think there's an attitude change. I mean, uh, my generation, the generation before me, maybe uh, even the one right after me, um, we tend to see in, intellectually at first these arguments for IP, for openness. Okay. But morally, like I remember 15 years ago, I was like, intellectually, I see why these patent and copyright laws are bad. But I've got to find another alternative free market way that we can um, dissuade people from copying things like privately, almost like charity, right? So as, as libertarians, we believe that there should be no welfare laws, but we think people should give to charity. But over time, I've overcome even that, and I think the young generation doesn't have that hang up at all. They're used to file sharing. They're used to competition. They're used to… Dynamically, things you know, things happening dynamically, changing on the internet very fast. Um, new business models rising and falling, so they're not surprised at all. They don't see anything morally wrong with remixing, right, or copying. That's part of what they do. So I think they don't even have the initial moral hangups that we might have. Okay, now that's where the the battle is. I can see it. You know, it's like you'll watch a movie and they'll have a little PSA, public service announcement. Now you wouldn't, you know, steal this and you wouldn't copyright that and you wouldn't take. You're a bad, evil person if you own evil and evil in junior high and it was added in MPAA included as part of the curriculum. Evil. Okay, so I can see where this is going. So they 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 try and make it to where they're questioning, but what has not happened. And the only thing that I see what you have been the first one that on the radar screen that I've seen has happened is given an intellectual argument that it's okay, that there is some kind of overriding principle that it's, you know, it's brain cells configured because I read and now it's mine, it's in my brain, it's mine, mine, yes. kiss my ass, I do what I want, mine. And that was never done before. There was never well, the, the ammunition. The, the criticism we get from people like Mr. Smith, who... Again, I'm a great admirer of. Uh, he's a great libertarian. We're good friends. Great, I, I right don't have anything bad to say about O'Neill. No, but so the criticism you get from people like him when they're trying to come up, cobble together an argument to defend something like copyright, they they won't they don't want to defend copyright because they know it's a government creation, but they don't want to def- they don't want to oppose it either. They they're not it's not really clear what they're in favor of, but they they'll come up with these terms like where well, you're a communist, you're in favor of stealing, and I think. And what they imagine is this group of pirates, all these people that are just these kind of layabout loser student types who just want things for free. They don't want to pay for anything. So they imagine that the pirates, the guys that copy things on on Pirate Bay and BitTorrents, they imagine they're just lazy and they just don't respect property rights and want things for free. What I want to say is, listen, you have a good reason to – Ed Stephen can sell intellectual property rights to the list. There. Yeah, so what I want to say is don't feel guilty about learning and using information that you've gotten legitimately on the free market. If people put it out there, feel free to build on it. Feel free to learn from it. If someone puts out a movie or a, a song, there's nothing wrong with copying it, with listening to it, with building on it, with doing your own version. Nothing yeah, wrong. No, no that's my point. Once that happens, because they do it anyway. They don't care. They're like, yeah, yeah, it's easier, it's cheaper. I don't have the money. I got it and done. But they didn't have the intellectual ammunition behind that so that they didn't feel any kind of concern or guilt or fear. 
You know, once they are armed with the intellectual argument, it's all freaking over as if you could stop them anyway. But now they're are, you know, they're armed with, you know, the idea that supports what they're doing. That's the power. That's it's all these mental hurdles and roadblocks and brain chains that they're putting on us. You know, it's a brain chain. I like that one. You you are allowed to use it. You're the first. OK, so <laughs> the one thing that I, I wanted to uh, tell you before I got to go is um we were producing, we used to do newspapers. You know, we did hundreds of thousands of newspapers, you know, in the 90s and early 2000s and so on. Our last one was in 04, and we're creating another 32-page broadsheet, four-section kick-ass. So we're, you know, be distributing to do 10,000 of the fur, blah, blah, blah. Very controversial issues on there. I need this argument, an intellectual property kind of, you know, to this. Gen- do you have something that we can, you know, steal, liberate, borrow, take, publish? That would be to this end. Do I have something you can steal? You mean like an argument or? or yeah, article? no, an article. We're going to put the, a newspaper, ten thousand pages, you know, uh, issues going out with, you know, but it's going to be in the company of things like uh, when do you shoot a cop by Larkin Rose, legalized methamphetamine by Mark Victor. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, but Paul Rosenberg, you know, on uh, the gotcha, next generation. Gotcha. So I'm, you know, intellectual property should it be included? Hell yeah, because it's going to that market. Do you have something? I, I, or I just go rip it off. I think I can I can point you to a few things. I'll, I can email you. Um, actually, Jeff Tucker and I. Jeff Tucker is sort of my uh, my my partner in crime on this issue, and uh, he and I are working.